just before the battle, mother. I am thinking most of you. While upon the field we're watching with the enemy in view. Comrades brave all around me lying filled with thoughts of hope and God. Well, they know that on the morrow some will sleep beneath the sun. Well, welcome to the the Reedville Fisherman's Museum um, lecture series at Festival Hall. Uh, this is the last one of our series this year. And uh, it's going to feature John Fry. Uh, John Fry uh, is an author of uh, three uh, Civil War era um, novels. And he's working on his fourth right now. And he's going to talk about uh, one of them, The Scoundrel and the Spy. Um, See, uh, John uh, has uh, written extensively with uh, the Washington Post and the Ang uh, Yale, Yale Angler's Journal and uh, uh, numerous other legal uh, journals. And uh, he uh, lives in uh, Reedville with his wife, Ethel. And I'm just going to let him give a further background and uh, get started here. Thank you for coming. And Good evening. It's a great pleasure for me to be here on this side, looking at you rather than down there looking at somebody up here. Uh, thanks to you, Betty, for the introduction, and I should say also for the pre-talk publicity. I learned late last week that the marquee in front of Festival Hall uh, advertised Confederate spy John Fry. <laughs> And so I think I should say initially that I am not now, nor have I ever been a Confederate spy. I see the sign has been somewhat revised now, so that it's a Civil War spot. I haven't been that either. Um, <clears throat> this book is set in the war. And I think to start it out, it's best for me to tell you what's going on in the war because it does have a material bearing on what happens to our characters. Although the basic story is not about the war itself. It's not about battles and winners and losers. It's about what's going on with these characters. <clears throat> it's set in Richmond in 1862. Now in 1861, the first year of the Confederacy, the Confederacy had won a major battle at the first Battle of First Manassas. And they really thought that was it. They had won. They were now an independent nation, and they could go their way and not worry about the Yankees anymore. The Yankees had different thoughts. They uh, followed up with a major force, moving up the peninsula from Fort Monroe down on the bay to Richmond with the intent of laying siege to Richmond. And it was commanded by General McClellan who was an extremely cautious general. His opponent was General Johnston, who was also a stream, an extremely cautious general. And McClellan inched up the peninsula, Johnston inched back toward Richmond, and so on it went, until Johnston ran out of room. He couldn't go back any farther. And so he did initiate a battle and that was the Battle of Seven Pines, which does play in the book, although it was not a major military in engagement and there was no clear winner and loser at it. Um, <clears throat> the major thing that happened at the Battle of Seven Pines was that Johnston was wounded and Robert E. Lee took command. And when that happened, things changed dramatically. Um, <clears throat> Now, Richmond, of course, is looking, I mean, they can practically see McClellan. He's that close to Richmond. And Rick McClellan can see the spires of the churches in Richmond. 
So things are getting pretty tense there. And there is in Richmond uh, a military commander of the district of Enrico, and that is General Winder. There you see him. He is a historical character. He's a uh, really pleasant looking old cuss, isn't he? I mean, uh, he was a, an ardent secessionist and he lived in Baltimore. And when the Confederacy was founded, he moved uh, to Richmond and was given command of the military district of Henrico. And he ruled pretty much with an iron hand. But he had the misfortune of being uh, duped by a Union spy, a fellow named Timothy Webster. And Timothy Webster really doesn't enter into the story, but he sets the background for what this guy is doing. Webster represented to uh, Winder that he could carry messages back and forth between Winder and secessionist in Maryland and Winder and his son who was still in Maryland. But in fact, Webster was carrying messages back and forth from Winder to the War Department in Washington. Uh, he was caught quite by accident when he was recognized, and he was hanged, and that was the end of Webster. But it sure wasn't the end of the matter so far as Winder was concerned, because he was humiliated, and he wanted Richmond rid of spies. No more spies in Richmond, no more chance for anything like this to happen to him. Now let me tell you about the principal characters, and the three principal characters are fictional. Um, and I, I guess preliminarily I should say that uh, when I got into writing on a serious basis back in the 90s, uh, I was quick to find out that these characters become very real to the author. And one day, I hadn't been at this all that long, I came down for lunch and I must have had a silly grin on my face because my wife looked at me and said, what have you been doing? <laughs> and I explained I've been having this conversation with the characters. And she said, mm hmm Would you like to tell me about that? <laughs> but they do become very real. And I say that, and they do for me are very real. The first, the first character that I want to introduce you to is James Smythe. And James Smythe is a uh, son of South Carolina aristocracy. He grew up on a plantation in the low country outside of Charleston and uh, was educated at Princeton. Uh, after he left Princeton, he read the law and, and established a law practice in Charleston. And he was a fire eater from the word go. With some apologies to South Carolina and South Carolinians, I do have to relate the report of uh, a remark that was made when someone was uh, advised that South Carolina had seceded in 1860. And they thought that was a very poor idea because South Carolina was clearly too small to be an independent nation and too large to be an insane asylum. <laughs> well, South Carolina proceeded and they and it paid very dearly for it, as did Virginia. Um, but Smythe fits that definition, I think, pretty well. He uh, organized a cavalry troop, and he went up to uh, the Potomac River with the army and had the misfortune of having a lucky shot hit him in the left forearm, and he lost his forearm at the elbow. So he's still convinced that he can do what he does best, which is run down and slay Yankees. But <clears throat> the powers that be send him to Winder because he's a lawyer and Winder needs a lawyer to chase down these spies and get rid of them. Doesn't like that. Uh, he thinks he gets a, a kind of an ar informal arrangement with Winder to be sent back to the cavalry should he hang uh, some spies. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, that's pretty hazy. And the other thing that characteristic of Smythe is that he is a notorious womanizer. And he looks around Richmond and he sees all these attractive young women whose husbands are all fighting. And he's not quite so upset about his assignment. <laughs> there. So that's Smythe. <clears throat> the second major character is Catherine Page. 
Now, Catherine Page is Smythe's cousin. She is from Lexington in the Valley of Virginia. She uh, and Smythe spent their summers together when they were children, and they were great pals, and constantly running around together, and constantly getting in trouble together, and just having a wonderful time. But they hadn't seen each other uh, since they left their childhood years, although they had kept in touch by correspondence. Uh, <clears throat> Catherine had been engaged to a young man from Lexington who was killed at the first battle of Manassas. And that threw her into a deep depression, which lasted until early 1862, when she decided that enough of this, I've got to get on with my life. I can't spend it doing this all the time. And uh, she decided that one of the things she could do to help her break the depression would be to go visit her friend Louise Taylor in Richmond, where she was sure there would be lots of parties. There were, and lots of young men. There weren't, they were all fighting. And that would help her get uh, back on an even keel. So she does that, and she uh, reconnects with Smythe there. Uh, they're both anxious to see each other again, but Smythe is totally blown away now. This tomboy that had been his pal as a child is now a gorgeous young woman, and he has to have her for his wife. No ifs, ands, buts about it, nothing to discuss, that's it. And uh, Catherine is not interested in that. She's not interested in getting into a serious relationship with anyone at that point in her life, although she looks forward to doing that at some time in the future, but not right then. Plus, there's the war on and all of that. So it just isn't the time. But Smythe is undeterred in pursuing it. The third character is Andrew Strickler. And Andrew Strickler is a um, naive, young Presbyterian minister from Abington in southwest Virginia. He had wanted to enlist when things began to get uh, hot uh, but his father, who was also a Presbyterian minister, uh, told him not to, that he could do, be a far more service if he would pursue his ordination and minister to these poor people who would be uh, uh, off fighting rather than to uh, go and fight himself. So he does that. He sent to the mountains west of Abington uh, initially and spent some months there and then because of the siege or impending siege of Richmond, uh, his presbytery decides it would be much better to send him to Richmond to minister to the soldiers. And he does that. He has arrangements with a former professor of his uh, <clears throat> to give him assistance and help him get along and get his feet on the ground in this, in this ministry. And he calls on this fellow, and the fellow is very helpful. What he doesn't know is that this fellow is a unionist who has attracted the attention of the authorities, and so he is being watched by Winder and his people, Smythe. And Andrew makes the mistake of mentioning that he has this arrangement, and that puts Andrew on the list of people to watch as well. Uh, as a result, he has to wait a considerable time and get jumped through some hoops before he finally is able to convince the authorities to issue him the next necessary credentials so that he can go visit the troops defending Richmond, which is his whole purpose. Now, <clears throat> he eventually does that, and he does begin his ministry from a boarding house in the eastern suburbs. He would ride out in the mornings and tour various units, hit different ones on each day, and then come back in the evening. And once a week, he would sit down and write reports back to his presbytery, at which a certain Elizabeth Van Lu was usually present. How many of you all have heard of Elizabeth Van Lu? A couple, no, a few, yeah. She was perhaps the preeminent union agent in Richmond during the war. She was so effective that uh, when Richmond fell, 
Grant sent a troop detachment of troops with the sole mission of protecting her. Um, she she was, and I think, you know, there's a there's a very good biography of her written by Elizabeth Farron, who was a professor at the university, and uh, I, she spoke recently in at Christ Church, and I happened to be there and mentioned a couple of things that I had run across that she had not. I have a feeling that some of the things that Elizabeth Van Lue was doing are what's at the grave with her, that we don't know to this day all of her activities. At any rate, there she is. And she befriends uh, Strickler, supports his ministry uh, monetarily. She's very wealthy. Uh, She's, uh, as I say, a spinster, lives alone in a very large mansion, which is there, on, on Church Hill in Richmond. And if you flip to the next slide, that's Elizabeth of the Lord left in her garden on the opposite side of her mansion. And then the next slide shows uh, an interior room in the mansion. Now this one, I'm sure, must have been taken uh, quite a time after um, Elizabeth Van Lue had vacated the place and probably passed on. Uh, and one of the reasons I say that is that uh, in this group of pictures at the Valentine History Center, there is one from her house of a little telephone table with a telephone on it. <laughs> Just a giveaway. But the real giveaway is a little flag stand with Confederate flags on it. So I think it's pretty, pretty safe to say that was some time later. All right, so there we have Elizabeth Van Lue. And as they say, it is probably time for the plot to thicken. Uh, <clears throat> Smythe, of course, is pursuing Catherine. Andrew is pursuing his ministry to the troops. And uh, he gets, in the course of his ministry, <laughs> thrown with a uh, sutler who's a real uh, scoundrel, scallywag of a guy. He needs, uh, these sutlers were peddlers, essentially, who followed the troops around, selling whatever they could sell to them. And this fellow was not only doing that, but he was also trying to gather military information and send it across the lines by his black servant uh, to sell to the Yankees. He. Uh, and Strickler get thrown together quite accidentally. They get into a, a discussion, and Strickler, being the naive young minister that he is, decides that his mission at this point is to save this man's soul. And they end up in a kind of an informal wager that uh, Strickler will have him on his knees and praying at some point, which the settler says is simply not ever going to happen. But <clears throat> there it is. Uh, after the uh, Seven Days Battle, uh, Strickler finds himself, uh, uh, quite by accident, in the midst of a stream of wounded Confederates coming back to Richmond for treatment. And it's his first exposure to the horror of the war, and it is quite a shock to him. And it takes him a while to adjust to it, but he does adjust to it, and he does minister to those men as best he can. And then he, late that evening, goes back to his rooming house. And the next day, Sunday, which he routinely takes off, he uh, looks for a quiet place he can go and rest and pray. And he thinks St. Paul's Church downtown would be the place to go. So he goes there, but he finds it full of wounded. The pews are gone. The wounded scattered helter-selter throughout the church. And there is a single surgeon up at the crossing, assisted by a couple of orderlies, who's sawing off arms and legs as fast as he can. <clears throat> it's pretty chaotic. Strickler also finds Catherine. Catherine is trying to bring some sort of order out of this chaos, which she has also stumbled into. And so he stays and assists her, and the romance gets started there. Uh, in the evening, he walks her back to her friend's house, and uh, they make arrangements uh, <clears throat> for him to meet with her uncle, who is a, an Episcopal priest, and who is also Lee's chief of artillery. 
Uh, and that comes about. Strickler is invited to preach to the uncle's troops, which he accepts, and he agrees to do it. Before he gets there, though, he calls on Catherine one Sunday afternoon. And who should he find on the porch, on the swing, sitting right next to Catherine, but Smythe. And of course, they grew up together. They're very familiar, you know, and Strickler immediately gets the impression that they're practically engaged, and he feels she's just been leading him down a primrose path, and he is really humiliated by this whole experience. And, but he, he sticks it out and manages to get away uh, without creating too much of a scene. <clears throat> and then subsequently goes to preach to, excuse me, to the general's troops. Now, <clears throat> Smythe, of course, knows this is happening, and he knows that, um, <clears throat> that Catherine wants to go here and preach. So he says, I'll drive you out there, and he has an ulterior motive, obviously. He'll give him several hours alone with her. It'll be a good opportunity for him to work his magic. Uh, and <clears throat> so Van Lu hears about it. Now there's another little wrinkle here that I haven't told you about yet. There's the old saw about keep your, uh, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. Van Lu has got General Winder wrapped around her little finger. And she has told General Winder to have Smythe come board in her mansion, which Winder does. So Smythe is in the mansion. She very easily finds out what's going on, and she says, oh, I'm going too, and he's nothing he can do about it. He's got to take her, so off they go. Catherine and Van Lue are talking about Strickler, and Smythe going to a high boil and stuff, which is made worse because after the uh, church service, uh, <clears throat> The uncle seats Smythe at a far off table and puts Catherine and Strickler right together at the head table. Well, that, that is not what he wanted to have happen at all. But off we go. He's smoldering, how do I get rid of Strickler? And he's plotting. And Strickler then ends up following the troops in the Seven Days Battle began very shortly after that. Uh, seven days, uh, Lee's troops are moving very, very rapidly. Uh, Strickler has to hurry to catch uh, keep them. It's difficult to keep up with them, but he manages to do it, usually by connecting with the field hospitals and uh, doing his ministry to the wounded. Um, <clears throat> he also runs into this sutler again. And the sutler wants him to get about the business of saving his soul. And in the process of all of that, he gets to swipe Strickler's journal. And Strickler's journal has all the information that he's recorded about the units he's visited, how many people he saw there, where they are, where they've been, where they expect to go. But a lot of, a lot of valuable inter military information, which Isaac, the settler recognizes, may have some value. So he, uh, he swipes it, and he sends it across the lines with his black servant, but the black servant is caught. The journal ends up on Smythe's desk, so Smythe is overjoyed. And he's got Isaac, pretty much open and shut case on Isaac at this point, and he sends the plug ugly says the police were called out to arrest Isaac and they do and beat him up pretty badly but they don't kill him and he's brought back to <clears throat> thrown into Castle Thunder and we can get to Castle Thunder. This was a notorious prison in Richmond during the war where they locked up the real dregs of society, you know, and the traitors and people that were just far too bad even to go in with regular prisoners. So that, that's where Isaac ends up. And it doesn't take any time at all for Smythe to get a conviction and a sentence of death on uh, Isaac. 
And so he, he brings Isaac in and he says, look now, if you help me, maybe I can help you, perhaps if you're willing to tell me all about how uh, Strickland was in this spying with you, then uh, we can just forget about this uh, death sentence. Um, Isaac, to his credit, doesn't want to do that. He, he feels that is something that is just sort of beyond the pale and he doesn't want to do it. But Smythe prevails on him and he does. And he does implicate uh, Strickler. Smythe immediately goes out and has Strickler arrested as soon as he comes back from the battles and thrown into Castle Thunder. Uh, he then tries him and uh, convicts him by a split verdict. It was a three judge military tribunal and there was a dissent uh, on, the, on the board by a fairly uh, a well important judge, not a junior man at all, and someone who had a, a persuasive opinion that uh, Strictly ought to be found innocent. So, <clears throat> anyway, he's got that, he's got the sentence of death by hanging. And Strickler is then thrown into the basement of Castle Thunder. And Smythe comes back from testifying, and he is raising one ruckus. He is wailing and crying, and he's got to go see Strickler, and they tell him, you know, how could they, this makes no sense whatsoever to uh, Sergeant Davis, who happens to be in charge. And Davis does everything he possibly can to dissuade this <coughs> and prevent it, but finally just throws up his hands and says, why not, not just take it down there. So he does, he takes him down, takes him into Strickler's cell, and uh, <clears throat> Isaac immediately falls on his knees before Strickler, wailing, and crying, and begging forgiveness, and it all comes out what has happened. So now we know. Uh, Davis knows and Strickler knows. And Davis, it just so happens, is a family friend of Catherine's family. And he knows Catherine is in Richmond and he knows Catherine is concerned about Strickler. So she go, he goes to her and uh, tells her that uh, Strickler is in Thunder and he has gotten convincing evidence that he, in fact, was convicted on perjured testimony. Um, what to do? Davis tried to get the commandant to do something, but the commandant told him to mind his own business and not rock the boat. Uh, what to do? What does Catherine think that should be done? Well, Catherine uh, has to think about that. She knows that it would do no good whatsoever to go to Smythe. That the only way she might get some relief for Strickler from Smythe would be by offering herself to Smythe, and she doesn't want to do that, and she's not sure it would work anyway. So what to do? She decides, I'll go to Van Lu. She has been in touch with Van Lu over this matter. She's had Van Lu go to Winder a couple of times to try to uh, convince Winder to not to enforce the, uh, the judgment, uh, but that does no good. And so she goes back to Van Lu and says, look, now that, now that we've got this, surely General Weiger will, will change this horrible result. And Van Lu says, well, I will try, but don't get your hopes up. I doubt it will work. So she does try, and she's right. It doesn't work. Uh, so she says, I will help, Mr. Strickler. We don't want to let, see this happen. We, I will help. But she won't say how. She wants all the details about everything she can find, but she won't say what she's going to do. And she has Catherine come back up to her mansion several times during the period between the, uh, the uh, sentence and the time that uh, the death warrant issues. And, uh, Every time Catherine is beside herself, you know, what are you doing? What you said you help, what's happening? And all Van Lu will tell her is, ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. So, come Thursday, the hanging is scheduled for Friday morning. Van Lu tells Catherine, please come up to my mansion 
and be with me. I think that would be the best place for you while this is happening. And Catherine agrees. She says, you know, she knows that um, Van Lu is sympathetic. Uh, she knows that Van Lu is aware of how much in love she is. She thinks this is a good place for me to cry it all out and get started getting over it and get back without necessarily letting everybody else know what's, how much uh, I'm involved. Uh, so she comes up. Now, Van Lu has a side to her. And I think it was probably a, uh, a diversion that she practiced, and it was very effective. Uh, crazy bet. It was crazy bet. Whenever I think somebody was getting a little too close to finding out what Van Lu was up to, crazy bet came out of the closet. And people would say, I don't know, pay no attention to her. She's just a crazy old woman. You know, leave her alone. You know, good, more important things to worry about. And that's who was present when Catherine arrived that Friday morning, crazy bed. And Catherine was taken aback. She says, look, I, you know, you don't need to distract me with all this. Just all I need is some sympathy and a place to cry it out and whatnot. Nonsense. You are going to see this entire house. I'm going to give you the grand tour. And she does. You know, she gets the history of all the ancestors and all the portraits and all the art and all the furniture, and all the antiques, and all the carpets, on and on and on ad nauseum. And by the time <clears throat> Van Loo gets her up to the attic, her patience is totally worn out. And when Van Loo asks her to move a trunk away from a uh, partition in the wall, which is there, having been moved away, yeah. Her temper leaves for parts unknown, and she loses it. She says, you've never done anything. The only thing you're interested in is yourself and your own comfort and, and just leading people on like me. And this, this is absolutely awful. And I can't see anything in there, but it doesn't matter, because I can certainly see I have been made a fool of. There's a little shuffling noise by the door, and she looks. And there is Andrew Strickler, wearing a Confederate uniform. Jojo, again, I haven't told you about Jojo yet. Jojo's an interesting character. Jojo is James Smythe, personal servant. Jojo closes the door and steps in the attic, grinning from ear to ear. Um, and Dan Lu, or Crazy Bat, I should say, takes this as her cue to exit, and Van Lu, master spy, takes over. She is angry with Jojo. You are late. You were out on the street after they knew he was gone. That was very dangerous. You're going to get us all hanged. What happened? Why? Jojo apologizes. It seems that Strickler knows he's Spice's servant. And Mr. Kerr, understandably, was a little nervous about going with him. But uh, he did, and Jojo managed to get him to the mansion and into the attic safely. Now, <clears throat> Van Lu sends uh, Jojo down to get some food that's warming in the oven for Strickler, and has Strickler sit down on the trunk that was in front of the, of the that's the chamber itself, uh, the next slide. <coughs> secret chamber. Uh, <clears throat> Jojo gets the food, uh, or goes down, I should say, initially. And of course, uh, <clears throat> during all of this business, uh, somebody's got to get the blame for this escape. And you know who? It's James Smythe. Uh, Winder is pretty put out with James Smythe to begin with, because James Smythe set him into this brouhaha, uh, political brouhaha, over the conviction that he got of, of Strickler on very, in a very tenuous case. And the papers on one side say, how can you possibly hang a, a man who was just an uh, innocent preacher trying to do his best to minister to the troops? And the other side say, hang the spy, get done with it. Now, 
he's, he's in the midst of a, a brouhaha and he doesn't like it. Uh, he sends Smythe out to get him and get him on the double quick. Smythe, of course, knows Strickler is from Abington in southwest Virginia, so obviously Strickler would be headed back to Abington and that would put him west of Richmond. Uh, so he takes the uh, General's Cavalry Troop and charges off west of Richmond, having told Van Lu that this is what he's doing, and to catch him. Van Lu, as Jojo gets Strickler all scrubbed up, shaved, hair trimmed, into a new suit of clothes, and bedded down in the secret chamber uh, until the following morning, when Jojo drives the carriage with Strickler, Van Lu, and Catherine east of Richmond to deliver Bibles. <laughs> and they do, you know, they've got their Bibles, they've got their fake identity and all this sort of thing. And uh, so they, <clears throat> they go along and once they pass the last checkpoint and they're out in the country, uh, Van Lu pursues permits a little bit of conversation that might be incriminating if it were heard by someone who shouldn't hear it. And that's when Catherine tells uh, uh, Strickler that, and oh, by the way, did you know Clem Davis is an old family friend? And immediately the whole thing becomes clear to him that she was the one who was the moving force behind his rescue. And she was. So off they go to the church. Uh, first church in the list. Uh, he jumps out with some Bibles to put them inside the church, which he does. And <clears throat> when he comes out, the carriage is going off into the woods, and he charges on it after it. And no sooner gets in the woods than he's spun around by this big sergeant, which panics him <clears throat> until he uh, realizes that uh, there's a big embossed U.S. on this guy's buckle. And so he realizes that he doesn't need to worry about being captured at that point. Uh, he wants to go to, uh, or rather, excuse me, he wants Catherine to go with him. And he tries to convince her, and, and she basically wants to. But she doesn't for a couple of reasons. One, her family, all her family is back in Virginia, and she feels she just simply can't abandon them and leave without a word as to what happened and why she's going in. So she refuses on that basis. But more importantly, because everybody, or people knew, not everybody, but people knew that she was with Van Lu uh, on Friday and was with Van Lu uh, on Saturday. And <clears throat> it would not be good for Van Lu if suddenly she disappeared along with Strickland. So she says, for that reason, we can't do it. We know now what she was doing. We can't do it for that reason. And she uh, refuses. So somewhat brokenhearted, but also very glad to be alive, Andrew Strickler departs with the cavalry. And if you want to know the rest of the story, <laughs> it is now in my computer, and I think it may be finished. <laughs> Well, I think I did leave out one thing that, that is of interest, and um, I, let me go back and pick that up. Uh, the way Davis got Strickler out of Castle Thunder, uh, he took him to a room next door, dressed him in a Confederate uniform, and walked him out the front door. <laughs> That's based on an actual incident that happened, not at, at Thunder, but at uh, Libby Prison where a sergeant who was, had a reputation for being extremely harsh uh, singled out one particular Yankee prisoner and go in the guard room and the fellow did, got in the guard room, sergeant said, look behind the counter, uh, he did, Confederate news says, put it on and get out of here, which is what happened. So, I will be happy to try to answer any questions that anybody might have. I think it's always more fun to me if there's an exchange going than if I'm just sitting up here and talking. Yes, Claire. Is the Van Lu uh, mansion still there? Is, it still is the what? Is the Van Lu mansion still there? Is it 
still exist? No, it does not. It is gone. Okay. It has been for some time. No. Mm -hmm. Yes, Barbara. Barbara. I was interested in which of the characters you were having a conversation with. <laughs> <laughs> different book. The ones that got me in trouble were different book. Okay. They were in the, in the, uh, the first book, which is now is published now as well, with God on their side. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Is the building that was Castle Thunder still in existence? That I don't know. I, I doubt it. I think Castle Thunder may well be. Um, I'm, I'm not certain. There is a building down in that area of Shaco Bottom, and I can't remember the name of the company who uh, owns it, but when I worked in Richmond, they told me that upstairs all the, the floors were still stained with blood from this injured soldier. Really? Yes. Yeah. Could be. I, I don't know. There, there were two famous ones, Castle Thunder and Libby Prison. Libby Prison was where they uh, locked up the captured Yankee officers, and from which uh, I think around 100 actually escaped by tunneling. Um, and they, it might have been there. I, Thunder, I, Libby was actually dismantled in Libby. <coughs> I don't know what's happened with Thunder. It's on Carey Street. I know that. If that was your building on Carey Street, it might be. It was, it was down, down was, in that area. Yeah, and it, I can't remember now the name of the company that was there, but I remember the employees telling me yeah. that the floors were still stained with the blood. And they couldn't get it out. Yeah, there really, was so much of it. Could be. Could be. Good for you. I was, I was, at the time, I was a judge at the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. And uh, prior to that, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And law practice prior to that. So. Do you know what happened to Winder after the war? Do I know what? What happened to the Winder? The, the, uh... oh, Winder, Winder did not survive the war. Okay. Winder had a heart attack and uh, died toward the end of the war. And it, I think people feel he was probably fortunate because uh, he might well have taken the rap for the, I forget the name of the officer who was hanged by the, by the Union because of the mistreatment of the prisoners at, at Andersonville. And I think people thought if they hadn't, if Weiner had survived, he probably would have been hanged. John, is there an area in Richmond, a um, little suburb or something called Seven Pines? Yes. There, I'm sure there are. All that area is very much grown up now. But, but um, I don't know that Seven Pines is part of the battlefield park or not. I'm not it's sure. It, not may be. it may well be. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, the only, it was really the only substantial engagement that Johnston and McClellan got into. And then, of course, Lee took over and things changed dramatically. Well, if there's no further questions, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. And John, uh, and we will we have, shall um, meet, but we shall miss him. There will be one vacant chair. We shall linger to caress him.